Hello and welcome to Let's Code an Indie Game episode 30. This is the series where we learn the tools and techniques needed to get started with indie game development. In this episode, we're going to make a couple of fixes based on the changes we did last time. Okay, let's bring up the code and uh, very quickly talk about the last episode. So last time we added another room to our game. And in doing so, we made a couple of changes to our view class uh, and a couple of other classes as well. But the one I want to talk about to start with is our view class because we've introduced this uh, pretty annoying screen jump or screen pop when our player moves downwards. Um, you can kind of see it happening, happening there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and fix it. So if we look at view.lua, um, the change we made last time is we changed our view offset to 0 instead of 10. So if we just set it back to 10 and run our game, we can see that we have some padding around our level. And is that padding that scrolls when our player moves up and down, and left and right, but we really notice it when our player moves up and down, and when we have the padding, our up and down movement looks nice and smooth. But when we take that padding away, um, it just looks very jerky and we get this uh, just this screen pop that doesn't feel very nice. And the easiest way of fixing that is just to go into our update function and change the code which updates our view position um, in the y-axis. So what the job of our view class is, is uh, to control what the player is looking at. And every time we update our view class, we set the x and y position uh, to follow our player around. But now we're going to keep the Y position stationary and only update the X position. And that that's actually fine for us because most of our rooms are pretty um, narrow anyway um, in the Y direction. So now everything is nice and smooth again. So nice easy fix, we just uh, had to delete a couple of lines of code. Which is always nice because the less code you have, the less code you have that can go wrong. Okay, the next fix. So... Uh, someone did point this out when I first added the controls to the game, or first added the um, sort of z-axis controls to the game, that it just it doesn't feel quite right. And I wanted to try it for a couple of episodes just to make sure, but I, I definitely agree with them. Um, it just doesn't feel intuitive to have our player move sort of diagonally when we hit the up and down buttons. So let's fix that as well. And this code is actually... Oops, that was the wrong button. Um, this code is actually inside of inside of our vector class. So in our vector class, we have this world to screen method or function. And what this does is it takes the 3D position of our player in the game world and it turns it into a 2D position which can be drawn onto the screen. Uh, and we use a projection called a cabinet projection, which spreads the z-axis value out between x and y at an angle of 45 degrees. Uh, that's what this theta value is doing here. Um, and while it kind of works in the maths, it doesn't feel right. Um, again, a lot of the changes in this episode are just about game feel. So what we're going to do is, instead of 45, we're going to change this to 90. And then our player just moves up and down. Nice and neat. Uh, the downside of this change, or the, um, the extra thing we have to do because of this change, is it means a lot of our start positions are in the wrong place. And so now if we move, if we move between rooms, uh, we put our player in the floor. But that's okay because we need to change that code anyway because now we have two rooms so we don't want to uh, hard code those values. So um, yeah, another nice quick fix. We can change this value to 90, or because cos of 90 is 0, um, we could just delete this line here, and actually, can we delete that line? Yeah, delete this as well, because if we time something by 0, uh, we get 0, and um, sine of 90 is 1, so that's the same as just timesing this by 1, and if we do that, we no longer need this theta value either. So let's just uh, check I haven't made a maths error. Nope. Um, good. So now let's fix the fact that we um, put our player in the floor when they try and move rooms. So this is also an opportunity to 
add the player's um, entrance and exit values to the individual floor plans instead of hard coding them. So currently these values are hard coded inside of room.lua. Here they are. Um, and this was fine when we had one room, but now we have more than one room and eventually we want um, our entrances and exits to be in different places based on the room. So what we need to do is set those values um, first of all in these files, but then pass them through also in our floor plan files, but then pass them through to our tile map. So let's go into our tile map and uh, make those changes there. So in tile map create, we'll add two new arguments and we'll call one player start left and one player start right. Uh, the values are already in the autocomplete because uh, I recorded this episode with the camera off. So I kind of, uh, I know what I'm doing uh, to a certain extent because I've already done it once. Um, but I'm doing it again this time, hopefully with the camera on. So players start left and players start right. And we'll just go ahead and set players start left uh, to be players start left and players start right to be player start right. There we go. Now to find a good starting and or a good start left and start right position, uh, we can just run our game in debug mode. So before I do that, let's go into main.lua and set debug to be true. And one of the things debug mode does is it prints uh, our player's location for us. So let's find a good starting location. So maybe 2090 looks pretty good. So inside of dungeon room, let's actually pass in the arguments. So the second argument will need to be nil uh, because this is the argument we use for the background and our dungeon room doesn't have a background. But then we can pass in our player start left value and I think I said that was going to be 2, 0, 90. So we'll just use a user table for these with x, y, and z values. And now we need, um, so y will be 0 and z will probably still be 90, but we need to find the x value for the end of a room. Uh, so let's, um, let's find this value. Three hundred and eighty something looks pretty good. So for now, let's go with three hundred and eighty-six, and we can always tweak tweak these values later. Okay, so now we actually need to use these values somewhere. So let's just walk that through. So in our tile map, we now set our player start left and our player start right values. Um, and now we need to look at where those values are actually used. So they are first of all set in the room, um, but then they're used inside of map.lua in our next room and our previous room functions. So these are the functions which get called when our player moves into a new room. So um, there's a nicer way we can do this, which is inside of room.lua instead of entrance x and entrance z exit x and exit z. Uh, we're going to delete all of these properties and replace them with two functions. So we'll have one function called get entrance and there'll be instance functions so they'll take self and they will just return self dot tile map dot player start left for the entrance and get exit will be very similar but it will return player start right self dot player start right oops sorry self dot tile map dot tile map dot player start right and let's just make these functions available inst dot get entrance equals get entrance and inst.getExit equals get exit. 
Okay, now inside of map.lua, inside of next room, instead of um, grabbing these properties, and by the way, the way we use, the, I'll start again, the reason we're using functions um, instead of properties is it just makes it nicer. It um, There's this idea in object-oriented code that you want your classes to be decoupled and to have clean interfaces. And if you start pulling out uh, properties everywhere, it makes it very hard to change a class uh, and know what those changes affect. Whereas if you have a function, you can always change what happens behind the function. And as long as the function still does the same thing, other classes don't need to care about how it works. So it's just a way of making your code easier to change and easier to use going forwards. So what we'll do in next room is we already have the new room, so we can now just say local, and we'll call it start position uh, equals new room get entrance. So next room is when we move into a room um, from, or when we move into a room for the first time. So we want to use the entrance, and then inside of player's set position, we can just say start position dot x, start position dot y, and start position dot z. Cool, and for previous room, we can do something very similar. We'll say local start position equals new room, and this time we'll call get exit. And in here, we will use start position x, start position y, and start position z. Okay, and before we uh, go ahead and run our game, we also need to use these values in our dungeon room as well. Sorry, in our bridge room, because I don't think we've set them there yet. Correct. Okay, let's uh, see if this works. Good. Now, the other thing we need to change is the test for when we should move rooms, because currently um, our player will just bounce around when they try and move into the next room. And this is because as soon as they move into the next room, we actually bounce them back into the previous one again. So that code lives inside of room update. So let's look at the update function inside of our room, and we can see why that is happening. So in these two lines here, we work out if we should be calling next room or previous room based on the player's position. And we currently use the room width um, minus one tile, which is actually pretty big. So um, I'm just going to tighten these values up. And um, we'll say room width minus two for uh, checking if a player should move into the next room. And we'll say if a player's position is less than two to check if they should move into the previous room. So that's just a lot, a lot tighter on those values. And we'll also, rather than just having um, a random two floating around, what we'll say is local room change threshold equals two, and then we'll use that value down here, just so we know what it is when we come back to it later. Okay, let's give that a go. Good. That works, and can we move backwards? Yes, we can. Great. Whew. Okay, so the other thing um, this is making me look at is the room width. So if we look at where we set room width in uh, room.create, we currently hard code it to 50 values. Um, and we also set a room height value, which we no longer use anymore. Um, at least I don't think we use it. So let's delete it, run our game. Everything works fine. Cool. So um, a good practice to get into is uh, deleting code which isn't used, because then you don't have to worry about maintaining it. So room width shouldn't be hard coded, especially now that we have two rooms. So instead, we want to grab the room width from our tile map. But if we look at our tile map, 
um, we can see that it's also hard-coded here as well. So this feels like something we should now be passing in from our floor plans. So let's make the second argument tiles wide. And then we can just set tiles wide to tiles wide. Uh, we also have tiles high here, which is uh, misspelt for some reason. Um, and if I just search for tiles high, this doesn't look like it's being used either. So um, let's delete this too. You can always put it back if something goes wrong. Okay, whew, getting towards the end now. Uh, just, I think, one more. We'll make this change and then we'll see how we're doing for time. So, uh, this room is 50 tiles wide at the moment and our bridge room is also 50 tiles wide. So now we set that value on our tile map all the way from our floor plans and then inside of our room where we actually know our tile size because uh, we have our tile sheet inside of our room we can say room width equals tile map dot tiles wide times tile size. Okay, everything still seems to be working. And what this change means is we can actually have rooms which are different widths. So just to finish off the episode and to uh, check if everything works, um, I have a version of the, of the bridge level which is wider than our previous one. So let's go in and update our bridge to the new wider layout. And this is actually 70 tiles wide. So now if we uh, keep running across our rooms until we get to the bridge, we should see that it is longer than it was previously. And this wasn't something we were able to do at the start of the episode, so it's always nice to finish up with a bit of new functionality. And there we go, that room just feels longer. Of course, the final thing we need to do is update our exit position, which is about 548. So now we'll just set this to 548. And let's just find a bridge room quickly and check that that works, and then we can wrap up the episode. Actually, as we're doing this, because it might take um, a while to find a bridge room, I'll just uh, sort of say the goodbye now. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying the series. Uh, just a quick reminder that all of the code is available on GitHub. If you check out the comments, you can, um, you can see it there and have a look for yourself. Thanks very much for watching. If you do have a couple of seconds, a like or subscribe does go a long way and lets me know people are interested. And I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.